Um, I'm Amber Northern. I'm the Senior VP for Research at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Uh, welcome all of you here. I'm, I'm exceedingly pleased to moderate this panel today. It's called Three Hoover Fellows on NAEP, A Nation at Risk and the Future of Education Reform. Uh, that's a, a, a lot to talk about, uh, and we're going to do our best to get to all of it. Uh, as you know, just to set the stage a little bit, the U.S. Department of Education uh, recently released earlier this month, I think it was April 10th, it was actually my mother's birthday, uh, the results of the National Assessment of Education Progress, affectionately known as NAEP, or the Nation's Report Card, uh, which told us how fourth and eighth grade students are faring nationally. We also have 12th grade results, but they were not reported this, this last time. In every state, they also have reports on big cities in math and reading. This month also marks the 35th anniversary of a nation at risk, which we'll also touch on today. So we're here both to sort of uh, reflect upon those two momentous occasions, but also to look at Ed Reform's progress since the 1980s, uh, to look again at what the latest NAEP results mean for America's future, and also what the next generation of Ed Reform might bring us. So again, tall order. We have ambitious aims for this panel. Uh, but I think we're, we're going to meet those goals. Uh, the event today is hosted jointly by the Hoover Institution, the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, and Education Next. So a hearty thank you to all three of those organizations for bringing us together today. Uh, before we get started, let me quickly reference a handout of NAEP results pulled together by our handy research intern, Nicholas Munyon Penny. Uh, those of you who came in, in today should have gotten that. I, I just want to spend a second on it because I think it's going to be useful uh, background for you today with these results. Uh, it's a back and forth handout. It's chock full of sort of small trend lines uh, for the main NAEP assessment for reading and math at the national level. But you also have these subgroup performances by white, black, and Hispanic subgroups. Uh, it's, again, it's back and front. Apologies that we don't even have more subgroups in 12th grade. I, when we could have made this really long, but we really wanted you just to have it more as a reference. Uh, most of you may know the main NAEP is administered every two years in grades 4, 8, and 12. Reading, as you'll see on your trend line there, began in 1992. Math testing began in 1990. Um, so again, that'll be helpful background for you today. A little bit of audience participation before we get going. What's the one word that folks most like to use to describe the NAEP results? Flat, right? Flat. Um, so uh, you're going to see on your, on your page there, that's what you're going to see for the most part, but you'll also see increases in the late 90s and the early 2000s, especially for our black and Hispanic students in math, uh, where gains are particularly pronounced there. So again, we'll dig into all this. We're going to talk about these flat lines. We're going to talk about where we see small changes up and down, the bumps. We're going to talk about what states and potential, uh, potentially what districts we think are doing a better job than others. Um, so anyway, hopefully that'll be a good reference. Let me quickly introduce our distinguished panelists, uh, all again who are, have senior affiliations with Hoover, which is what they have in common. Uh, I'm going to start in the, uh, to my left here is uh, Eric Hanischek, uh, also known as Rick. He's the Paul and Jean Hanno Senior Fellow at, the, at um, the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Checker Finn Jr., who's in the middle. He is the uh, Distinguished Senior Fellow and President Emeritus of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. And at the end, Paul Peterson, the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Government at Harvard University. So please join me in welcoming my three Thank panelists. You. Thank you. Uh, all three of these gentlemen are giants in the education policy field. You'd have to be under a rock not, not to know that. So I'm honored to moderate uh, this panel. I want our audience to get maximum benefit from the panel, so I'm going to just set a few expectations first. Uh, the biggest is that I'm going to ask our panelists to please engage in a discussion, which we were having a little bit in the side room before we got started. We got done there. We, we did not. <laughs> um, I think all of us want to be part of a conversation, um, and so I'm going to ask them to, to do that as well as they can. They've known each other for years, so I don't want them to act like uh, they don't know each other. I don't want them to be too polite. Um, I've seen them disagree. None of them are wallflowers. I know them to varying degrees, and none are wallflowers. So I'm going to ask that they uh, not be too polite today, engage in, in each conversation, give counter opinions. I'm going to do my best to sort of foster that, that discussion between them. Um, anyway, we want to be transparent and interactive in, in all that good stuff. Um, I'll also ask for them to keep their, conversa I mean, their, their answers brief and on point so that we can keep the dialogue flowing. Um, and I hopefully won't have to um, interrupt anyone for long-windedness. I don't think that's going to happen, but uh, I will do it if I have to. 
um, because we want to keep, again, this to be very interactive. We're going to leave about 20 or 25 minutes at the end uh, for, your, for your questions. For those of you who are online uh, on social media, you can join the conversation at hashtag future of ed reform. You can also ask questions at the end using that hashtag. Whew, I believe that's all my housekeeping. <laughs> All right, we are ready to start with our opening question for each of you. I'm going to start with the latest NAEP scores and what they mean. Um, again, try to keep these remarks, these opening remarks, to five minutes. You guys can help me time it if we need to. Uh, Rick, I'm going to start with you. Um, you've devoted much of your life's work on how better educated students and high quality schools uh, can enhance our country's economic growth and development. So I'd like you to just tell us what you make of these latest NAEP results. Uh, the trends, the recent results, and how they impact our economic prospects. Well, thank you. Um, I always marvel at every two years when NAEP results come out at how you generate excitement about a flat line. <laughs> and, and that's the effort to find something that you can generate excitement about. But it's the flat line that really gets me excited because uh, there is, in my opinion, pretty conclusive evidence that a nation's growth rate depends upon the quality of its citizens. And the quality of citizens is seen by what comes out of our schools. Uh, you can measure the quality of citizens by scores like NAEP or internationally like PISA. And countries that have people that do better on those tests, it's a meaningful measure of the skills that are important for economic growth. And the impacts are huge. Um, the impact of getting halfway to Canada. You know, Canada looks like us, a little colder, but it looks like us, right? Um, if we could get our schools up halfway to Canada, closing the gap by a half, we could think of the average wage of every worker in the US over the next 80 years improving by something on the order of 12 to 13 percent. Now, some of it's backloaded because kids that are in school, it takes a while before they're getting to the labor force. But on average, if you take it all into account and compare it to what would happen with no growth, we're talking about a 12 to 13 percent increase in everybody's paycheck. Now, to me, that's substantially, uh, substantial enough that we should be talking about much more serious reforms than, well, maybe we should uh, s slowly reduce class size over the next five years, or things like that that do the same as we've been doing but don't have any impact. Well, you did great. All right, uh, let's move on to Paul. Uh, I'm not going to ask you a similar question, which is first, you know, what do you make of these latest, latest results and trends? Um, we all, we talk a lot about misnapery, and we shouldn't commit misnapery, which is just the tendency of all of us to want to figure out what's going on behind this progress or lack thereof. Um, so I'm going to give Paul a little bit of uh, permission to commit misnapery if he'd like. Um, but uh, on to you, Paul. Well, I know you all have the hand out there. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, but. Uh, our online audience doesn't have the handout, so I thought I'd just sort of bring out some of the highlights that uh, you already have in front of you. Uh, but I thought we needed a, a scripture passage to guide our discussion. And uh, I chose Genesis 41, verses 29 to 31. Uh, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten. It shall be very grievous. OK, so the years of great plenty are not so long ago, but they have been totally forgotten. According to Rick Hanushek and some of his colleagues, including myself, the growth rate on the NAEP test scores was 1.6% of a standard deviation per year between 1995 and 2009. And that's sums up to 22% of standard deviation, which comes to, I would say, about two-thirds of a school year additional learning. So over that period of time of 13 years, in the period of plenty, we actually saw substantial improvement in, at the fourth grade and eighth grade levels. That's summing all that up. 
So then, if I can get this thing to work, um, there were the years of famine to follow. So the first period is up here on the left. And this is the fourth grade reading, fourth grade math, fourth grade, eighth grade reading and eighth grade math, all the four bars there. And you can see that it wasn't a flat line. It was a significant change. And if you t break it out by white, black, and Hispanic, you can see that those bars go up quite a bit in the past and not much at all in the last eight years. Um, and in New York, they were making reasonable progress, not in one grade, eighth grade reading, but otherwise they're making reasonable progress, but are going backwards, right? All the plenty shall be forgotten. And then if you go to Indiana, that doesn't look so bad. You know, it's like they, they weren't doing so great back then, but they're in the, they're in the ball game now. Um, so, and of course, Indiana is where all the school reform is today. It's the last place where school reform is really being tried out. Uh, Florida did have it. This is the Bush. This is, we were getting double Bush here, Jeb and, 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 and George combination. You got spectacular results back in the double Bush days. Uh, and now, not much. Um, and then if you break this out by ethnic group, it just looks worse. So the, the big picture is bad, but if you look at out by white, black, and Hispanic, you can see all the high bars in the past in New York, and now negative bars for blacks and Hispanics for some of the subjects, quite a few of the subjects. And um, Indiana doesn't, even looks better now. Now Indiana starts to look like they are still doing what was going on back then. Florida, the picture is even more dramatic when you break it out by subgroups. So really, something really changed in 2009. But what happened after 2009? Well, we got a new president. We had an election where No Child Left Behind was a target. And the new president wisely chose not to try to enforce this law. It was not politically acceptable for him to do so. He did provide $100 billion for schools as part of the stimulus package. Uh, he, the Department of Education had put through race to the top, which was to come up with a bunch of alternatives that the states would design that would solve the problem. And they gave people waivers from NCLB if they promised to do some other stuff. But they only had to make promises. There was really no enforcement mechanism like there was with NCLB. And then we've had a slow recovery from the financial collapse. So I think that's the, the discussion we're going to have. What really did happen in 2009? And to me, the message that I take home, and I'm not saying that I saw this when all these events were unfolding, but we did have an accountability system that was being put together at the state level in 1995. And it was then put on a national level in 2002 with the passage of No Child Left Behind. And we actually got progress. We weren't paying any attention to the time of plenty. We didn't put any grain into the silos for the time of famine to come. And now we really look back and we have to realize that that was the good times. And these times are different from what we've had. It's not just a flat line forever. It's a recent flat line. Very good. Uh, I think we're going to circle back to a lot of those themes. I think Paul gave us some good fodder uh, that we'll return to throughout the discussion. Uh, Checker, we need your opening remarks. Uh, again, I want to kind of zero in on this case that you've made over the years that we need to be spending more of our resources, more of our time, more of our attention to gifted education, and in particular, high achieving black and brown children in high poverty schools. Um, so I want you to talk specifically about what you see in these NAEP results that are both encouraging and discouraging about the performance of high achievers. Well, I will, but let me first sort of take pos po partial issue with what Paul just said. Oh, right. uh, Because you wanted that. I did. All right. Um, I was saving it, but bring it on. 
Uh, <laughs> implicit in what Paul was saying is that if we had kept up the accountability pressure, it, we would have continued to see greater gains. And, and that is possible. Uh, it is possible. I'm stuck on the State Board of Education in Maryland where we are not keeping up much accountability pressure, and I can see that we're not going to get many gains. So I get, I get that. But I also think we might have reached the maximum of what accountability can do as a reform strategy, and that we can't take for granted that accountability NCLB style, federally mandated interventions in schools, uh, would continue to grow more grain. Uh, it might. I'm not convinced that it would. I think we might need some new reform strategies if we want to get back on the into seven more years of plenty. Uh, so let me let me say mm -hmm. that. I think that the um, one of the few bits of good news in the in the most recent NAEP results is that uh, by a couple of different measures, high achieving kids did better. Uh, more kids were at the advanced level on NAEP, and uh, the kids at the 90th percentile went up more. Uh, and um, I think that, um, I don't know why, uh, I don't want to commit Miss Napery even and, 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 and speculate, um, but uh, that was a gain that turns out to have been going on when we looked at the trend for about 10 years. Um, gains at the high end, not nearly, nearly, nearly enough. I mean, still tiny numbers of kids at the advanced level, and, and you still compare with PISA data, see how many kids are in the top quartile or, or top, uh, top two grades, the grades of five and six on PISA. Uh, number of Americans in those numbers is still tiny um, and uh, hugely inequitably distributed within our population so that more privileged kids are vastly more likely to get into those high scoring groups on PISA than poor kids. Um, but uh, nevertheless, some NAEP gains uh, for um, smart kids or high achieving kids who are often smart kids. Uh, and this is uh, something we should figure out if we can, uh, what caused it and how can we do more of it? Because to um, neglect smart kids and high achieving kids, which we often, often have done in the name of equity on the grounds that they're fine, let's worry about the low achievers. Um, uh, to neglect uh, smart kids, particularly smart poor kids, uh, which I think we've done a, 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 a pretty weak job of looking after, uh, is both to inhibit their life prospects, and they are potentially the greatest sources of upward mobility in the entire society, are smart poor kids, uh, much likelier to be upwardly mobile than anybody else who's poor. Um, additionally, we, uh, we destine our uh, sort of elites to continue to be made out of the same parts of the population that they have historically been made out of. Uh, and that's not a good thing for equity or equal opportunity. And we also just waste, waste human capital uh, that we can't afford to waste uh, at a time when we have to keep importing it in order to, uh, uh, if we're allowed to import anybody, uh, when we have to keep importing it in order to, f to fill uh, jobs. So uh, this is a topic that needs to stay on the front burner needs to be on the front burner. I don't think it's on the front burner nearly often enough. But we have seen some good news. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, go ahead, Paul. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a counter argument that, uh, OK, you can, you can have an accountability system for 13 years. And you'll see the gains for 13 years. But after that, you're not going to see any. So you might as well abandon the accountability system and let people go back and do whatever they want out there without anybody checking to see what they're doing. Now, it's a possible explanation for, for what happened, but it seems to me the more logical explanation is when we shut down the accountability system, which we essentially did. I mean, it, was a, it wasn't overnight. The opposition to NCLB and the enforcement mechanisms of NCLB begin in the waning years of the Bush administration. There were lawsuits filed by teachers unions around the country. There was rising opposition from lots of school districts. People were pointing out that the way schools were being measured, the performance was being measured, was not really a very good measure. We should have a, a much better measure than that. They were right in making that argument. But what we got, and it can't, all the blame can't be placed on the administration. Congress refused to reenact NCLB and make adjustments in the law in order to make the accountability system a more effective system, it's, which is what it, it should have done. The whole issue got so embedded in partisan politics, as everything else does, 
that they couldn't make the adjustments in the legislation that were obviously needed at the time. But the end result has been, for whatever the reasons, the end result has been an abandonment of the strategy of reform that had been showing steady success over a sustained period of time. And I'm just not convinced that we had exhausted the possibilities of that strategy reform. Now, a lot of us, you know, part of it was in the title of the legislation, No Child Left Behind. And of course, children were being left behind. And so, you know, you could always show that that law had failed because you had set such a ridiculously high standard. But the one thing the law did with that, with that phrasing is it, it kept the people's attention on the importance of education. And you know, the bully pulpit may be more important. We're going to get to the nation at risk mm -hmm. downstream. But the bully pulpit may be more important for education reform and educational progress than any particular piece of legislation. And one thing that N NCLB did and the whole Bush administration did by focusing on education so much was to use the bully pulpit to bring the American public's attention to the importance of our schools. That has all been abandoned. You try to get a good coverage of an education story today that's not about safety, and you're not going to, it's not going to make it. The, the, uh, the philanthropic community has, has moved in a different direction. There's just a lot of signals out there that people are saying, oh, schools, so Paul, they're not you have that lots important. Of, yeah. Lots of problems with this, but you haven't mentioned fundamentally no child left behind was a bad law. It, um, it was fundamentally backwards. It said that the state should decide what we're doing in, in education in terms of the objectives. And if the states don't do it right, the federal government will tell you how to run your schools. That's sort of 180 degrees wrong. And yet, as a bad law, I think I agree with you that it got positive results. Now, it had probably run the end of its course because concentrating on the level of performance is not a good thing to do if you're worried about the whole range of distribution as opposed to the growth and performance ac across schools and things like that. But um, you know, fundamentally, that was a bad law. But we sort of threw it all out, um, to, in large part, with ESSA said, well, if this law didn't work, let's do something else. Um, so let me follow up on that point, um, Rick, because I think implicit in this whole discussion is that what the federal government does actually has an impact on NAEP scores. Uh, and, and you guys can clarify whether you actually think that's true or not. I guess one thing I want to push on, because this is what Paul was getting into the end, you guys have seen a few administrations in your, in your time. I'd like you to think about. What are um, you suggesting? William well. McKinley was my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want you to think about, okay, what's the ideal role for federal government in education? And reflecting back on the different administrations you've seen, who do you think got closest to your ideal role in education and, and what administration did not? Uh, and talk a little bit about that, because I think maybe we'll see some, again, some differing opinions in, in terms of who we thought, and, and it doesn't matter, public endeavor, I'm just talking about the policies enacted by that particular administration? Well, they accumulated for a long time until uh, the last five years. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make a pretty good case that at least from the end of Reagan to uh, ESSA, there was a pretty straight line of federal policy regardless of who was in the White House. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we've uh, sort of, and it involved ever increasing uh, federal management of things. Okay. And then that has, in fact, been significantly changed. Are you avoiding my question? Yes. <laughs> I answered okay. with McKinley. I, I'm, I'm going to give you a particular president that I have a special fondness for, Gerald Ford, who signed into law. The well, All Children Handicap Law. What's it? Was it PL uh, 94142, right? Public it was Law 94142. The Education of All Handicapped the Children Education Act. All Handicapped Children, which created this system of special education, which has many problems associated with it, but it was transformative. 
lots of children, such as my own son, now had a right to education that they didn't have before. Before that, you didn't have a right to go to a public school if you were extremely handicapped or disabled. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think Gerald Ford gets the credit. All right, Rick, so, come on. <laughs> economists don't talk about politics. Um, let me, uh, uh, my, <laughs> my, my response is more on what the federal government's role should be. I think it has a role in really being clear about what our kids should know. Okay. And the federal government is in a position to know um, not only what the neighboring state is doing, but what Germany is doing and what uh, Hong Kong is doing, et cetera, and what's possible in terms of performance. And the federal government is a much better place than uh, the individual states to make statements about what our objectives are. And the federal government is terrible about actually running schools, and that ought to be done at a much more local level. Um, and we ought to get out of that business altogether. Federal government does um, uh, special education. It has a role there because that's a national issue that you shouldn't allow, I don't think, to be done at the local level so much. And the federal government should do research because there are economies of scale in research. Now, the problem that I have is that each administration sort of waffles about uh, what their objectives are and, and what they want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true of Republicans and Democrats. They fixate on some particular set of policies. And we talk about the policies as opposed to what we hope to get done. And that's, uh, that's uh, a plague on all your houses. So I, you have, I have reached the unshakable conclusion that when it comes to education, everybody has the greatest degree of faith in whichever level of government they've had the least direct experience with. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a good generalization. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's shift a little bit. I, I got a little bit of, I didn't get exactly what I wanted out of that question, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go for a little different angle. Uh, Checker, I was actually um, pretty, uh, I guess, moved. Uh, it was a jarring statement you made not too long ago in a blog post. The single best thing that could happen to American education in the next few years, now aren't we all like, what, right, is for the National Assessment of Educational Progress to begin regularly reporting state-by-state -state results at the 12th grade level. The single best thing that could happen to American education next few years. Please elaborate on that. And there's one person in the room who could cause that to happen. <laughs> Not me. Um, the, the, um, the decision made in NCLB to require state level reporting of fourth and eighth grade results was a very important decision. It actually had momentous um, effects on what we know and states' ability to know how they're doing, our ability to compare states, governors' ability to know how their states doing, all that. Um, bizarrely, we get at the 12th grade level only national information, and you know nothing from NAEP sources about how uh, Tennessee compares to Maryland or, or Utah or Oregon, um, because there's no such data coming out of NAEP source. And therefore, if you want to know about 12th grade stuff, uh, you end up going back to how many AP passing scores did we get, or average SAT scores, the stuff that was discredited back in the days of the wall chart of Ted Bell in the, uh, uh, in the uh, early 1980s. Uh, and um, it's doubly painful now because we are in this era when tripping off of every tongue is college and career readiness, end of high school stuff. Uh, if end of high school is where we're really putting our um, enthusiasm and our policy emphasis, then we have to know how kids are doing at the end of high school. We know that high school graduation rates are treacherous. We know that just entering college is treacherous as a measure, as a metric. Um, uh, we know that grade point averages are treacherous as a metric. We know what's wrong with uh, using SAT scores and ACT scores and AP scores as this metric. Uh, the, the best possible metric we could use for this is NAEP, but we don't report it at the 12th grade level. And when you ask the powers that be why not, they basically just say, ah, the budget's tight. 
So let me just add Paul, to that because yeah. I don't disagree with, uh, with what Checker has said. I do want to point out, however, that we almost have a test case here because we measured student performance every grade between three and eight under NCLB. And then we only have one test in high school, which means that you really can't track trends over time because you've got to be able to see if kids are growing from one grade to the next. So we know a lot about what's happening in elementary and middle school and nothing about what's happening in the high school. And where did we see the gains in student performance in that 13 years of plenty? It was not at the high school level. If you look at the 17-year-old at NAEP scores, you see the flat line. The flat line was there when kids come out of high school. But we, at the time that we passed NCLB, we did not include the high school in what the accountability system was going to focus on. So we have to think of a different kind of accountability system for high school. And in my opinion, what we basically need is we have to hold students accountable by having end of exam tests Mike Petrilli has written an excellent article on that that's just come up at Education Next, and it, it really makes a convincing case that we need to have an examination at, in courses in high school that will allow outsiders to see who's learning, who's not learning, who's being taught, who's not being taught. Now, ESSA made this mm -hmm. one worse because insofar as there's high school accountability required of states in ESSA, it's high school graduation rates. Um, and uh, that is just an invitation to getting everybody a diploma without it meaning anything. So let me keep pulling on that thread. Um, Rick, I want to kind of get you in here. I, I, you've written a lot about America's declining productivity. I think it ties into what we're talking about here. I was reading an article you read, uh, wrote not too long ago, and you listed sundry things that may be at the root cause of this declining productivity. Um, teachers' unions, how we distribute resources, changes in the teacher labor market, and so on. So I'm interested in, I mean, do you have sort of a, a checker fill in the blank here? Like the biggest thing that we could do to improve American education in the next few years is blank, and does it tie into any of these things that you've, you've listed as causes of our declining productivity? Well, there's a simple story that I have, and that is, uh, essentially, my view of schools is that the only thing that counts is the effectiveness of the teacher. And the quality of the teacher is what counts. Uh, and so somehow you have to think about policies that affect the quality of the teachers in the classrooms. Um, and right now, um, salaries are unrelated to effectiveness. Unrelated. So if you do a West Virginia or an Oklahoma, where the teachers on average look like they've been woefully underpaid, and you raise everybody's salaries, what do you expect to see? Well, I don't know how many teachers there are in Oklahoma and West Virginia. That's the number of happy faces you see, but you don't expect to see any change in achievement. Um, because at least in the medium to long, it will take a long time before just raising the salaries of everybody changes the pool of teachers, changes the people who come in, and on average, you do better. Um, in the short run, you worsen the problem because, um, well, there's an economic principle that I don't always tell everybody. You have to have a doctorate in economics to know this. But it's that bad teachers like more money as much as good teachers. <laughs> And what you'll find is if you raise everybody's salary by some amount, you'll, keep, you'll probably slow down the rate of turnover in teaching, but you won't do anything to the quality of teaching. So that's what relates to this whole story. Um, the school systems that do well are ones that one way or another find a path to getting effective teachers into their classroom even though their main instrument, the salaries, or main instruments that we think of from at least private sector and every place else in the economy, their salaries uh, are not a, a useful mechanism to try to get more effective teachers. The ones school systems that do poorly, spending the same amount of money, are the ones that do not have a path toward getting high quality teachers given their salary structure. And so the one single thing that I would do, um, I would measure 12th grade achievement, but that's not the one single thing I would do. 
the one single thing I would do would be to try to align incentives with performance in schools. That's what's made the U.S. such a productive country as a whole, and yet we take this sector of our economy and remove it from the things that have made it productive. Paul, what's your one thing? Well, just adding on to Rick, uh, here in D.C., which is sometimes called a state by NAEP, so if you look up and see the results by state by state, up, up comes uh, District of Columbia. So it may be a little unfair, District of Columbia is not a state. They want to be. <laughs> but someday they might be. And so um, they gained more in the last eight years than any other jurisdiction, in, than any of the states did. Uh, and actually, they make as many gains in this period of time that puts them in the ball game for what was going on uh, during the years of plenty. So the years of plenty finally get to the District of Columbia. They get there late, but they, they've had them recently. Well, what do they have in the District of Columbia? Well, they have a lot of charter schools. There's a lot of competition in the district. And they have a a way of paying teachers based on merit. That was a huge battle to put into place, and Michelle Ree lost her job over it, and the mayor lost his job over it, but the system is still there. That, that, that structure of payment is, if you're not a good teacher in the District of Columbia, you can be asked to leave, and if you are a good teacher, you're going to get a very good salary, much better salary than other teachers. Mm -hmm. And teachers have have decided this is not such a bad system. They have an opportunity to be very well paid. And if you want to look at the place that's really doing well today, it's the District of Columbia. It, it tends to support what Rick was saying. So is that your one, are you sharing his teacher quality as, as the one big thing and compensation aligned to effectiveness? It's it would be a great thing if we could have, uh, we know that the teacher is the most important person mm -hmm. that the, in the school building for children's education. And we know that good teachers, uh, students learn a lot more from a good teacher. I mean, all we have to do is look at our own personal experiences to know that that's the case, but you can get data to show that uh, easily enough. And so why wouldn't you want a, system of compensation that rewards your excellent teachers and tries to keep them in the educational system. And why wouldn't you want a system that weeds out the ineffective teachers? And we can't get that in very, we almost don't have that anywhere outside the District of Columbia. And so, yeah, it's right up there. Okay. It's right up there. Of course, I think that the other thing that the District of Columbia tells you is that a robust charter school system is also helpful because mm -hmm. what the charter school system in the District of Columbia did is it put a lot of pressure on the district schools to look for a way to fix themselves. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of incentives to get better because they were losing students big time. So okay. that would be the, you put those two together and you've got a pretty good reform strategy. Mm -hmm. I, Checker, on the want... teacher compensation point, I think one other uh, moving part needs to be added. Uh, Ed Week just reported the other day that uh, in almost every state, the number of teachers hired continues to rise faster than the number of kids in school. Um, we continue to employ larger and larger and larger numbers of teachers. It's up to a four million person workforce across the country today in K-12 education. And we've put all of that additional money that we, that we put into education into hiring more people rather than better people. And that's one of the main reasons that teacher salaries don't look very good is because they've all been the money, which is quite a lot, has been spread across an ever-growing population. Mm -hmm. So let me add a footnote on salaries. Whenever you talk about teacher salaries, there's a lot of confusion. Um, on average, we pay too little for our teachers. And then we maldistribute it. We distribute it in bad ways across teachers. Um, Recently, it's been possible to compare teachers around 30 countries in the world, around the world, on the basis of how much math and science they know and English they know, plus their experience levels and so on. So you can compare teachers on 
basically cognitive skills of teachers, which, you know, on, on average, smarter teachers are better than dumb teachers. That, that's a fact. Um, but um, you look around the world and see whether teachers are paid more or less than you'd expect for a person who have equal characteristics, cognitive skills, and experience in the rest of the country as opposed to teaching. So in Ireland, they pay teachers 40% more than other people in the economy. Hmm. And then there's a, a ray that goes down to the far end where the US and Sweden pay 20% less on average to teachers than other comparable people outside of teaching in other occupations. And that um, discount to, to paying teachers does have an impact. You can see it uh, uh, if you look around the world. The, you know, countries that pay more get smarter teachers. That's a simple fact. And smarter teachers do, in fact, get smarter kids. Um, now, that doesn't say how you should pay teachers. I have strong opinions that you've already heard some of those. But at the same time, we are completely underpaying our teachers. All right. Um, we'll loop back to the teacher quality because I think it's, it's going to come up again. Uh, but I want to shift briefly to a nation at risk um, just because we haven't touched on that yet. Um, for those of us who were not adults when a nation at risk was released, um, I want to just to feel a little bit about what the implications felt like to you back then. Because I think we, we hear, oh, it was this monumental shift and it was just a game changer and it woke up the country and it was a cascade of these things that happened. So was that the case? I guess just first, what did it feel like to you when it, the report was released? And then my follow-up is just to reflect upon, is there anything since then that has looked and felt to you like a nation at risk did when it was released um, you know, more recently? So who wants to take that first? Well, let me note that the midwife of a nation at risk is sitting in the second row. Welcome, Milt Goldberg. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the, uh, um, I, I, a relatively small number of people had figured out by 1983 that there was a problem and had even begun to uh, write and talk about it. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of credit for saying that Diane Ravitch and I were among the few that were writing and talking about it in, by 1981 or 82. Looked at things like declining SAT scores and other measures that were pretty obvious. Um, but uh, it wasn't a large population. A nation at risk hit in 1983. And, uh, and concurrently, uh, half a dozen other uh, reports and commissions and uh, books came out saying much the same thing. If memory serves, you were the staff on one of those. Uh, about the same time, weren't you? I was. Yeah. Uh, and um, so there was a bit of a wave built immediately. Uh, and then, of course, the other thing that happened was there was a counter wave. There was huge denial uh, from the uh, system. Uh, there's not a problem. Things are great. Um, <laughs> some of that continues today, by the way. But um, uh, certainly the, the, the paralysis of the system continues today. So there was a wave of saying there's a problem and it needs to be changed. And there was a counter wave, which said, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, leave us alone. We're doing fine. Uh, and uh, um, it sort of kind of stayed that way, I think, uh, historically, until the governors and, and, and Bush 41 got together in Charlottesville uh, and began to say, let's, let's do something. Mm -hmm. And then a bunch of good stuff and not so good stuff followed over 20 some years, uh, mm -hmm. probably culminating in NCLB um, almost exactly 20 years later. Um, but um, that actually catalyzed some action. And it was powerful enough because it involved you know, governors and presidents and things that it could to begin to overcome the, the counter wave um, mm -hmm. that uh, we had seen a lot of in the latter part of the 80s. Now, there's a, that's a very one man history view. <laughs> Paul? Yeah, just to build on that, um, when the report came out, and uh, Milt's here, so uh, he'll have to forgive me, but I wrote an essay that actually got quite a bit of attention because it was entitled, Did the Education Commission Say Anything? Mm. And the answer was bold, no, it didn't say anything. It's all puffery. There was a lot of 
talk about declining SAT scores and the nation was at risk, but it didn't have any policy in it. It didn't have any program in it. It didn't, it didn't ask the federal government to do anything. It just said parents and everybody has a responsibility. We must do something about it. This is a, a phony report, okay? I was wrong. <laughs> uh, it, it really, I've never heard him say that before about anything. <laughs> it, it really did have an impact that only looking back on it could you see that it provided the president and, and the secretary of education, William Bennett, a, a bully pulpit to talk about the need to do something about our educational system. And if you look at SAT scores, which were steadily eroding, down to 1982 when this report, they just, it, it's a V-shape. They're going down and they start going back up again. Uh, and then it does take time for all of this to lead to the accountability system that's being put into place. But the leaders of it are the Southern governors. The Southern governors have a political problem at this time. They want to build biracial coalitions. And the black community wants schools for their kids much better schools, much more adequate, much better built schools than they were receiving. And the white community was only willing to give this if there was going to be some system of accountability. And so the biracial coalition was more money for education. We're going to educate the African-American community, but we're going to hold the system accountable for doing this. And so you got these spectacular gains in the South especially. I mean, if you want to look at where the gains were being made in education in the 1980s, it was in the southern part of the United States. And we have some pretty dramatic gains on the NAEP, even among 17-year-olds in, in that period of time. Mm -hmm. So it was another, it's another part of the story that it's not just historically a flat line. There have been changes that have taken place in the past. And the, and the Nation at Risk report was a very significant document. Mm -hmm. I was wrong. I'll say it again. Rick, what do you Second time I've heard him say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I uh, guess I didn't had a more mild reaction to the report when it came out in the sense that I agreed with part of the conclusions that the nation was at risk. And I love Milt's flowery, flowery language because I use it all the time. Um, of, it was if rising un, tide of mediocrity. Rising tide or, or unfriendly, uh, foreign, unfriendly rising foreign power <laughs> imposed this on us. <laughs> rising tide of mediocrity. Mm -hmm. um, whatever. Um, but it, there's a negative side to it. I mean, it's one thing it did was establish the idea that we should all be concerned about our schools. And nobody would, since 1983, ever say we're not concerned about our schools. Uh, people will try to justify that we're doing OK and shouldn't make any changes. Um, but it has led to the ability to concentrate on strong statements that we have to do something about our schools without the follow-on of, well, what does that mean? What kinds of things are you going to do about your schools? And it sort of made that the norm. That's how you, that's how you argue about a flat line. You, you sort of say, yes, shows we have to do something about our schools. And you can say that every four years or every three years or now every two years with NAEP. Um, uh, and everybody's happy because you're for doing something about your schools. But it, since 1983, there's been no requirement, and there wasn't, I didn't think in Nation at Risk, a requirement to actually say what you're going to do about the schools. It said you've got to be concerned about them. So, Tucker, you mentioned the Charlottesville summit. Yeah. Was that something that felt more consequential to you than a Nation at Risk? or, or? Well, not, just, not just the fact that they got mm -hmm. together, though that was symbolically important that mm -hmm. all the governors and the president sat down together to talk about, we must do something about our schools. Right. Um, the, they actually came out with a, uh, a, a ridiculously ambitious set of national education goals for the year 2000. Mm -hmm. right. um, and um, though they were, uh, in retrospect, pie in the sky, they actually um, gave states something to work toward. There was a goals panel to track progress toward them. 
The National Governors Association got the bit in its teeth mm -hmm. to do something about this. A um, bunch of other things started to happen. Um, and, and the Charlottesville was followed within a couple of years. Clinton's in office by then uh, by the Goals 2000 Act, uh, which was the first real uh, federal marker in this, mm -hmm. uh, saying that states must establish educational goals and standards for themselves. And the same year was the, the ESCA reauthorization uh, called Improving America's Schools mm -hmm. that um, actually began to put some teeth in, into the requirement mm -hmm. that states must do standards and testing. So I'm not sure that would happen without the kind of nation at risk and then Charlottesville as kind of precursors to it. Yeah. Again, I think all these things had both the good effects that Paul was citing earlier with his seven years of plenty and some negatives. But I, I think historically that's kind of what happened. Well, I, I have to just talk about the uh, goal, uh, the goals 2000 in the Charlottesville summit. Um, the summit said that the U.S. would be first in the world in math and science by the year 2000, and that's what led to Goals 2000. So one of the things that I've done is taken and looked at the historic relationships between performance on these international tests and economic growth, and said, what would that have meant for the U.S. if we'd actually done, ah, done okay. this. Yeah. Um, and if by 2000 we were first in the world in these tests, it would have meant that two years ago, the added growth to added to GDP, GDP would be 4.5% higher than it was two years ago, which mm -hmm. is exactly what we pay for K-12 education. 4.5% of mm -hmm. GDP. Mm -hmm. So we would have said that by two years ago, had we met those goals, education would have been free in the sense that our GDP was that much larger that you could pay for the entire budget, not the federal part, not the state part, not could anything Could have doubled else. teacher salaries. Uh, you could have doubled teacher salaries. <laughs> um, and so that's what leads to my sense of urgency about actually talking about how you're going to do it um, as opposed to what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that uh, observation that uh, goals by themselves don't accomplish anything unless you have a follow through. And um, over the last few years, we've had an enormous debate over Common Core state standards and whether the federal government should be involved or whether the state should be involved or whatever. But the one thing we do know is that states raised their standards a lot in the last four, five, ten, six, seven years. So that definitely the Common Core state standards movement has had an impact in that state standards are being set at a much higher level today than they were eight years ago. Mm -hmm. But we also have the latest NAEP scores. So there's a total disconnect between the raising of the standards that has taken place over the last eight years and how many gains we're getting out of so good segue. Um, let's talk a little bit about states. Uh, the nation at risk, a little quote here, said the ingenuity of our policymakers in formulating solutions once problems are better understood is one of the tools that we'll use to get where we need to get. So I guess I want you to reflect a little bit about, you know, how, which states do we have these sort of, you know, uh, policymakers that are really doing a good job wrestling with their problems and coming up with solutions on the policy side. Um, and you don't have to name states, you can, but, but think about the types of things you think states and state policymakers can be doing to, to move the needle on some of our thorniest education problems. There's, there's, there's one key point, which is that for a state to succeed with any of these things, it needs to stick with it. Mm -hmm. It can't just change its policies every time there's an election. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, you know, the poster child over the last 25 years has been Massachusetts, and the thing they did best was not only set standards and put some teeth into them for both kids and teachers, but then stick with it. 
regardless of who was governor and regardless of who was the majority leader in the Senate and stuff like that, or state superintendent. Mm -hmm. 20 years of consistent direction mm -hmm. in the same state. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not, that's both about Massachusetts, but I think there's a larger yeah. point. Rick, you're nodding your head. No, I agree that? completely that uh, you haven't had that. Uh, the kinds of reforms that, that look good to me are the ones that Paul brought up of the uh, impact program in DC is one. It's been, it's moved slowly around the country. So I'm looking at Dallas, Texas, which has uh, a very, um, uh, I think, high quality program that hasn't been in place as long as, as um, DC. But the remarkable thing is how how short the legs are of, of these ideas, uh, that they, they're not racing around the country at breakneck speed and not moving around um, so that even where you see things that look successful, the replication is very uncertain, if not unlikely. Mm -hmm. So, Checker, you're on the uh, Maryland State Board of Education. You are their yes, vice Dan. president. Uh, speaking of states, um, talk to us a little bit about what <laughs> participating on that board has shown you about sort of the state of American education. Like, what have you, I don't mean to ask too lofty of a question, but what have you been hopeful about uh, in terms of what states can do and, and what they can't do as a result of your participation on that board? Well, the system doesn't want to change. And so the question is whether the leverage to change it is stronger than the leverage to keep it the way it is. And in Maryland, by and large, the leverage to keep it the way it is, uh, largely ex exerted through the, the state legislature, uh, is, and uh, is stronger than the leverage to make changes. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just a sort of political reality of Maryland, and I think uh, has been the case for a long time. And it's it's true in a lot of places. It isn't just it it, it isn't just Maryland. I mean, yeah, we accomplished an ESSA plan. Uh, that was good, and it's got some good stuff in it. But yes, it was circumscribed by the um, establishment not wanting very much in the ESSA plan. And so they got the legislature to put constraints on what could be in the ESSA plan. Uh, and so, uh, for example, any form of intervention uh, in a low-performing school or giving kids the right to leave a low-performing school was barred by state legislation. Um, and uh, therefore, it couldn't be in the ESSA plan, even if that was one of the remedies for low-performing schools that the state board might have thought was a good idea, which we did, most of us thought was a good idea. Weren't allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned uh, yesterday uh, in Baltimore that uh, the 7% Title I set-aside that supposedly could be used for competition for the best, uh, best reform ideas uh, to go to districts that really want to do something different. Uh, the very same state legislation that I mentioned requires it to be distributed by formula to all districts. Mm. Okay. Um, the uh, we I live in a state where the legislature belongs to the establishment. The establishment doesn't want to change. Mm. Um, let's talk about something that... Sorry. Oh, uh, hey. <laughs> She's now changing the subject. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to build on it because in some states, there's a little bit more appetite for competition, okay? Um, Paul, I'm going to circle around to something you said uh, in 2016. This was sort of the checker thing about 12th grade uh, NAEP. Introducing uh, the best hope. I'm not going to give the punchline. The best hope for American schools today what do you think he said? The best hope for American schools today is to introduce what? Competition, right? So talk a little bit about why you think that's the best hope uh, and how you think the competition needs to evolve to sort of meet its lofty goals to improve uh, what we've got now. Well, uh, I think I mentioned that here in the district, we have 50% of the schools are charter schools and that is creating a highly competitive system uh, and therefore, the pressure on the uh, school district to improve their schools is substantial. And the district has stepped up to the plate and made some major changes. So I think it is an example of what can happen. Another good example is uh, in New Orleans, where a new system of education was put together with lots of charter schools that are all trying to secure 
the enrollment numbers they need to survive, and uh, the New Orleans school system is a completely different creature from where it was before Katrina. So we have some examples out there where competition has uh, definitely been transformative. Now, a lot of people will point out, yes, the average charter school isn't any better than the average district school in the same neighborhood, and there's some data out there that supports that. Um, but uh, if you look worldwide uh, and you look at the size of the private sector, you will find the same thing. The kids who go to private schools aren't learning any more than the kids in the schools run by the government. But the more competition there is in a country, the better both kinds of schools are. So it, it raises the level of the institution of education in a country if you have competition among them. But I think I would not say that you, uh, you should put all your eggs in that basket. I would say really the three things I've talked about in the course of this conversation are things that I think all could be put into place and they would all make the system more effective if they were, if they were all put in together. One would be to hold students accountable in the high school years especially for their performances in specific courses so that uh, they're not being taking just generalized tests but very specific courses in English literature or in mathematics or ge geometry or his American history or world history, whatever the course is. So hold students accountable, compensate teachers on the basis of their, how they're helping students achieve their goals and finally create a system of competition. You put the three together and I think you have a different, more dynamic educational system than the one that we have. So not to hop around at shiny bright things, um, but other than school choice, something else that we have a lot of interest in these days is CTE, right? Career and Technical Education, we hear a lot about it. I was struck by a piece that Rick wrote not too long ago where he talked about not only career and technical education but apprenticeships. Uh, and you said, skills generated by vocational education facilitate the transition to the labor market but later become obsolete at a faster rate. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you found uh, relative to career and technical programs, why you say this, and how it might, what you're learning could impact CT programs today since we care about them so much now. Sure. Um, this relates to some work that I've done with colleagues in Germany about uh, the long run of impacts of vocational and apprenticeship programs. Uh, everybody knows that Germany has this very well developed apprenticeship program that's developed over a 35 year period. It has 350 different kinds of apprenticeships and so forth. They're very proud of it. And if you look at um, German workers who have been in vocational programs and apprenticeship programs versus general education programs, what you see is that at about age 45 to 50, the people in vocational education programs are dropping out of the labor market. And what this appears to reflect is that technology has changed. And the workers who had these very specific skills that helped them to get into industries didn't get the upgrading of skills and weren't very adaptable and ended up leaving the labor market. <clears throat> now, this is not a, a general argument against all training of skills. I think training of skills is important. But providing the solid general education is uh, important, and providing something called lifelong learning is important. Now, that uh, has become a buzzword in the European Union of we have to have lifelong learning, and there's no substance to it, no substance. And sort of if we're going to expand to, it, to any extent vocational training, we would have to think a lot more about how you provide ongoing learning. Now the, the other sort of thing that I would add to that is that um, CTE or apprenticeship programs seem to be very popular with everybody from the president to uh, 
85% of Congress that's for expanding these programs. And one of the main arguments that is explicitly used is, well, these kids went through K-12 to education, didn't learn anything. We might as well give them a skill. And this is just where the uh, lack of adaptability, the depreciation of skills comes in to bite. And that's where we would end up reproducing what I call the Detroit auto worker problem in the long run. Because the Detroit auto workers are people who had lots of skills and were very prepared to be in the labor market. And all of a sudden, technology changed. And it was the iPad and not the wrench that made cars. And you have this group of people there that have no skills and no ability to go to other places. We don't want to pre reproduce that in the long run. Mm -hmm. Anything on CTE, Checker, you want to add to those remarks, or Paul, given all the interest in it? Yeah, I agree that if we can get everyone or almost everyone a really solid basic education, then uh, adding some uh, workforce readiness uh, specialization would be a good thing. Um, I, not too detailed. That is, I don't think we want to produce another round of woodworkers and sheet metal workers mm -hmm. who only know how to do one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the skills you need for a uh, modern workforce include a variety of adaptabilities. And I should wash out my mouth the things that are passed for 21st century skills as well. <laughs> um, and uh, most, em most employers are happy to provide or willing to provide the very specific job connected skills that somebody needs on Tuesday. <laughs> Um, and so the job of the formal education system is to get people ready so that they can acquire those skills on this job and also be movable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Paul? Um, you know, the high school is a broken institution. I mean, you, you, if you talk to any student and ask them, did you enjoy your high school years? And the chances are pretty good that you're going to get a negative on that. They may have enjoyed all their friends and all the good times they had outside of school, but classes themselves were not very inspiring experiences for most of them. And so I think we have to think of new ways of providing uh, experiences for students in those crucial years in late adolescence so that they are productive years instead of years where people are just not learning anything. Um, and so vocational education may be a tool. I don't disagree with what Rick has said, but there may be ways of making education a more interesting experience and students can acquire general skills in the context of learning how to apply them to a specific activity. So I think that's the hope that if you could have a more creative, more, if you have a competitive system, then you could create schools that would have focal points that would allow for students with different interests to go to different places. And some of the, uh, the attempt to do everything in a comprehensive high school ends up doing nothing. And so a more focused secondary educational experience, I think, would be a way out of the malaise that we're currently in. Mm -hmm. I would just point out that that's partly how we ended up eliminating almost all CTE in our schools today was the argument that, well, we didn't want to teach specific skills, but if we, we would move in, into a system where people would learn algebra by measuring things and, and solving uh, Pythagorean theorems um, on the job, and then they would learn it rather than giving them the uh, A squared equals B squared plus C squared kind of solution. Um, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was not a successful innovation. It sounds good, but it didn't. It, you, you don't see that that really worked. You mean the application The to application the real world. in mm -hmm. the real world when we uh, did basically 25 years ago or so started eliminating all vocational education mm -hmm. in the comprehensive schools. Mm -hmm. 
I think he's saying they learned to pound the roof on, but they didn't learn the Pythagorean theorem in the process. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they learned to pound the roof on. Right. Okay. But the but the vocational schools that exist today that are specifically vocational schools are providing better experiences for students today than your typical neighborhood comprehensive mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. And the experiences they're having are not just experiences learning how to uh, hold a wrench. They, they're much more uh, college-bound experiences than that. So I, I think we can't just sort of say, no, vocational education is a dead end. We have to think of how vocational education can be made an experience where you do acquire the general skills as well as the specific mm -hmm. skills that can lead to lifelong learning. Good. All right, we're running low on time for your questions, so be thinking of them. I'm going to turn to a quick question from our social media audience. Uh, this one is for Rick. Um, do you think effective instructional materials can improve the performance of teachers? I think this come out of our discussion of the salaries, so I, I think the intention here is okay, even if we agree that the salaries aren't where they w are, how do you see the potential of instructional materials to get those teachers to a better place? I think good materials are better than bad. Materials, I mean, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yes, I mean, but that's not going to substitute for the quality of the teachers um, very well. And, you know, we've had not very good success at, at replacing teachers with machines. Um, you know, we have some technology that's helpful. It's not very uniform. It doesn't lead to very huge impacts. Um, and the same with other kinds of instructional materials. It, good is better than bad, uh, mm -hmm. but that's not the crucial element. Right. It goes back to the, the human and their, their abilities Absolutely. and capabilities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Questions from you guys, and I'll come back. Uh, Nicholas, are you got the? Okay, great. Uh, just identify yourself and be sure to ask a question. Okay. Um, my name is Emily Langhorn, and I work at the Progressive Policy Institute. And um, I agree with everything you said about teacher pay and merit pay, but um, I think professionalism is also a missing piece. And teachers aren't treated like professionals. Uh, they're not respected, and they don't get a lot of autonomy. And we all know that's because there's a lot of bad ones out there that aren't held accountable. The flip side of that is that teachers then leave the good ones because they aren't treated like professionals. And I've done a lot of thinking about this, so I think that in the US we don't attract high quality teachers because we don't demand them. In Finland, very rigorous process to become a teacher. You gotta be an expert in your content mm -hmm. when you graduate undergrad, and people respect experts. Um, in the US, the praxis is significantly easier than other entry level professional exams. Uh, and the public knows that. So I guess my question for you, because it is a question, yes, thank you. is <laughs> what suggestions do you have for policy changes that can, that can change who we have as teachers rather than how we treat them once they are teachers? Mm -hmm. So to me, the arguments about professionalism are real, uh, but they aren't ones that, um, that come from just, we all in this room agree at the end of the day we should call teachers professional. Um, I think you would make it a profession, well, there are two different views of what a profession means. One view of a profession means that everybody's paid the same as an accountant. Um, the other view of a profession is that people are, professionals are held responsible for their own performance. Um, and I tend to agree with the latter one. So if you, in fact, change the characteristics of hiring and retention and pay of teachers, I think they would be treated like accountants that are paid according to whether they do a good job or not. I mean, it's a <coughs> chicken egg sort of a problem ever since the days at least of Al Shanker, maybe back farther, the teaching field itself has been um, ambivalent as to whether it wants to be a profession or it wants to be a trade union. And uh, on the one hand, you demand uniform pay and lifetime tenure. And on the other hand, you want to be treated like lawyers, doctors, and accountants, uh, none of whom, to my knowledge, have uniform pay and lifetime tenure. Um, and I think that uh, this ambivalence goes deep. And on the whole, the union mentality has won, has prevailed. Yes, I know. I think it's a terrible thing that we have college professors who are well paid 
and have lifetime tenure. I do too. <laughs> so it, it is actually a worldwide problem of uh, lack of respect for teachers outside of Finland and Korea and maybe a couple of the other East Asian countries. Um, every country in the world says, well, we don't give enough respect to our teachers. But most countries in the world have the same kinds of lockstep sy systems. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jacob Rich, and I'm, my question is for Mr. Uh, Dr. Peterson. Uh, why is NAEP superior to ACT for testing? Why is? Uh, the NAEP score is superior to the ACT scores for judging. Um, oh, OK. So why is it that uh, I would prefer to talk about NAEP test scores rather than ACT scores or SAT scores? Um, well, the very simple reason is that uh, NAEP scores are uh, collected from a representative sample of all U.S. students in fourth grade, eighth grade, and at the age of 17. So what we get from the NAEP is a sample of the student population within a state or for the country as a whole or for particular groups such as whites or African Americans or Hispanic Americans. So we've got a way of generalizing to the population. When you talk about ACT scores, those tests may be better tests for some purposes, but only some students take those tests. Not everybody takes those tests. And so you don't know how the system as a whole is performing from those results. All you know is how those particular students are performing. And the composition of those students will change over time. Having said that, I wouldn't ignore ACT. Uh, information. Inf I would just treat it with caution because of the fact that you don't have a representative sample. Mm -hmm. Just one other thing, the college entrance tests aren't very helpful for information below the high school level. I mean, you don't get anything for middle school or elementary school achievement out of ACT tests and SAT tests. State assessments is a different old topic. Hi, um, Linda Gelfi. I was at a think tank meeting two or three weeks ago where they were talking about education and they said that what's happened in um, K through 12 is that um, a lot of men have gotten out of the teaching hmm. and it's much more highly female now than it was before and they thought that this like in other parts of our economy where we pay women a whole lot less than men is maybe affecting the pay of, of teachers now. So well, I, I would that, like to pick that up. Maybe, maybe you correct. would too. Yeah. Right. I don't, I don't <laughs> think it's factually correct that there are so many fewer men now than, than within any of our lifetimes. Um, what is cor factually correct is that many more women are going into professions other than nursing and teaching, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that that has directly impacted the quality who's of teacher, the teacher, who's a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my aunt was valedictorian of her college class and went into teaching in Cleveland. Mm. And I don't think you could find a single valedictorian of a college class today uh, who would go into teaching. And you it, might consider shunning future think tank events because they're <laughs> full of nonsense. <laughs> So the oh, um, do we have nonsense uh, Ichabod, today? <laughs> Ichabod Crane was a, it was, when you go back to his day, Ichabod Crane's day, it was a male teaching force. But in the 19th century, they discovered that women were much more effective and you could hire them for a lot less. And they really drove the males out of the teaching profession. They were just <laughs> too good. And uh, so we built our educational system on the single woman who taught for five years, got married, and disappeared, and they brought in another one. And that was my mother. Well, everybody has a mother or a grandmother who did that. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was the way our educational system grew. And it doesn't really change until uh, women get many more opportunities out there, which happens in the 80s and 90s. And I think that's, that was, one might say that's a very significant effect. For the, for the quality of American education today is the transformation in the kind of women who go into teaching. Uh, Peter Murphy with the Invest in Education Foundation. I'm wondering if you can comment on the prospects for reforms, for improvements, for the, the return to the upper 
trajectory of the NAEP scores um, with what I think are two impediments to that. One is at a federal level and a state level, there's this crowding out problem where the feds are spending more on health care as a percentage of the budget. The states are spending more on guaranteed pensions as a percentage of their budgets, I think, mm -hmm. one. And then two, the teachers' unions picking up on this idea of just the trade union. Um, even just in the, I think in recent years with super PACs and all that, they are much more, they've always been, but I think even more so are, have this political vice grip um, increasingly. And so I think with those two issues, like what are the, if you, assuming you agree with those, those two impediments, what are the prospects for improvements and policy change? Well, I'm relying on, on Checker because. Uh, and I'm moving to a different state. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the state level is probably your, your most, uh, your best hope, at least in some states, uh, because local school boards are very much influenced by the employees who work for the schools. They are the ones who pay attention to local school board elections. Very uh, small percentage of people end up voting in, in local board elections, which are often held on a day of the year other than the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. And so it's, it's really hard to have, you do see some reform efforts at the local level and they are often temporary. You know, they'll, a reform group will come to power for eight years or four years and then the employees in that district, and it's not just the teachers, there's a lot of non-teaching employees who are very active in local politics as well. And that's, you know, when people talk about the vice it's the districts and the, and the unions working together, and it's not accidental that they're working together. So, and to add to the problem on the financial side is Medicaid is having a huge effect on state budgets because the states have to come up with more and more of, the share, of their share of the cost. Their share of the cost is constantly growing, and um, it, it, it's crowding out the educational sector for, for sure. Higher education is getting an impact. Uh, the, the costs are being shifted to the students. Uh, tuition is climbing in the higher sector. We can't do that in, in K-12. K-12 is holding its own, but barely holding its own. It's slipping uh, from, from year to year. and It's hard to see which, what's going to turn this around on the financial side. So mm. you're right. These are very powerful forces. and. Uh, you know, it may be that we'll have to do something like what's done in the South when we realized that we had a racial problem that had to be addressed and education was the tool that, for addressing it and it will take leadership by governor. Governors arose, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and, Her was it Her Hunt? I've forgotten. Yeah, uh, Jim Hunt uh, in Jim North Hunt Carolina. Jim Hunt in North Carolina and Lamar Alexander, Lamar Alexander the, the, these were the heroes of that time that, that uh, led us out of, at least for a period of time, to a new way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. And I think if, we're, if there's hope, that's, that's the hope. So the, when I, I wake up some mornings very pessimistic. Um, but other mornings I wake up more optimistic for, in a variety of ways. And it's, there are little elements of optimism that might, in fact, be the sparks. One element of optimism is the the, the full-blown battle dress of Wisconsin and Scott Walker and whether you can change things. I don't think that's the, the full answer. But my other, another optimism is that, in fact, that the teachers' unions would see that it's in their interest to alter some of their policies. And I really believe this, that the teachers' unions would be better off if, in fact, they didn't act like the trade union that couldn't allow any worker to go. I think their salaries, teacher salaries, would be much, much higher if they allowed for some true evaluations of teachers and differential pay. You would get much higher salaries. And given the combination of that and the Janus lawsuit that's going to lessen the money that goes to uh, teachers' unions, that they might see that it's time for them to adjust. I mean, that's Public opinion says that the teachers' unions are less popular in the American public than the U.S. Postal Service. I mean, it, it, it's time now 
to see them rise to where they'll be in the future as opposed to just thinking that we'll have a, a, a strike on the automobile line or a strike on the West Virginia uh, school line. Fond as I am of demonizing teacher unions, the uh, education establishment resistance to change is way, way, way beyond teacher unions. Mm. Uh, it goes to ed school faculties, it goes to state associations of school boards, it goes to state associations of superintendents. Uh, everybody has, and I could go on, but everybody has their vested interest in the status quo. Uh, it goes to bus drivers and cafeteria workers and associations of school psychologists and so forth. Nobody wants to change. I mean, everybody thinks somebody else should change. Um, and um, I, I, possibly the phrase that has driven me craziest of all in Maryland is, let's get all the stakeholders together. <laughs> That's well, you. You're one of them. <laughs> guess what happens when you get all the stakeholders together? They just want more. They don't want different. I have one minute left, and I want to end this on a on a more positive note. <laughs> <laughs> I you could wake up like Rick. I this is the optimism. Pick one do. of Rick's good mornings. Then this is going to be a warm, fuzzy, personal question. But I thought I am moderating a panel with three gentlemen who have contributed so much to this field. And I have such respect for them, as many of you do. And I wanted to ask them, what, what, what do you think so far has been one of the highlights or of your career or the thing that you're most proud about, your work or scholarship, um, that you could leave us with? Anyone can, can hand. That's a softball. Somebody can okay, take that. So one. I'll take the softest of softballs um, over my time in this somebody says it's time to go okay it, 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 <laughs> I can't turn off my watch um, <laughs> the um, uh, the biggest change that I've seen that I think I may have helped to contribute to is that people now pay attention to the outcomes of schooling achievement as opposed to just pure input focus when uh, I started in this business the people would say oh we have a good school because a, we have small classes. B, we spend a lot of money. Um, C, we have teachers with master's degrees. Um, and over time, we've learned that we should pay more attention to whether kids are learning or not. Good. I had something to do in the late 80s with the reinvention of NAEP as something that would measure states and would have achievement levels built into the reporting of those scores. Uh, and I think that was a significant accomplishment. And now we should finish it by doing 12th grade state by state NAEP. <laughs> Number one. Paul. Well, I suppose I'm most pleased with the uh, efforts I've made to uh, look at school vouchers and to find out what effect they've had and uh, help to bring that to uh, the attention of the American public. And, uh, but right behind that is the uh, establishment of Education Next, which uh, is still with us today, and I'm pleased to see that that's the case. Very good. Uh, I'd like to thank Karen Morgan at Fordham and Aaron Nichols at the Hoover Institution for helping us to organize this event today. And I'd like to thank our panelists as well. Please help me to do that. <laughs>